Stop it. Stop it. I said... Stop it. Stop it. Stop it. That's what I thought. Hello, Internet. My name is Quinn, and this is Blondie Hacks. It's a big day on the Vertical Fire 2 boiler project. I'm going to do the first steam test today, and in this video, I'm going to run an engine on this boiler for the first time. Very exciting. But first, we need a safety valve. So let's go. Let's start with a funnel. One of the things I like to do with my 3D printer is make custom funnels for tasks that I'm going to be doing a lot of, such as filling this boiler. I print them with the tapping drill size as the opening, and then I can just thread it to fit the boiler fitting that I need. And I don't know if you can tell, but there's actually a little shelf in there that sits on top and directs the water inwards, so it's less inclined to leak. Now I can replace the blanking plug that we had on there for the pressure test of the fittings with the second standpipe that holds the safety valve and then my shiny new custom funnel threads on there. I know this seems silly, but it's honestly really quite pleasant to have a custom funnel like this to fill a boiler. It's something that you do a lot, and as you can see, it doesn't spill a single drop by doing this, and it only takes a, a little while to print a funnel like that. The safety valve that I've been intending to use for this boiler is this one. It's from PM Research. It's the only one they sell, so I bought it, and it's set to go off at 60 PSI, which is what I want, so it seems like a good fit. All right, time to kick the tires and light the fires. I'm gonna light the boiler here outside the boiler so I can see what it looks like, and it looks fine. So I'll set the boiler down on top. In the future, I'll light it from underneath the boiler in situ. You can see the flame percolating away down there. And we are officially heating water for the first time in this boiler. Very exciting. The unsung hero of this project, by the way, is the carbon monoxide detector. I'm going to link to this one below because it's great. It shows the actual parts per million as they increase in the area, and so you can actually see if your boiler is burning cleanly or not and get some warning about maybe when you should move outside. And there it goes now. So I opened the shop door wider so I could get more ventilation in here. Then it settled down, and I passed the time twiddling my thumbs while we built some pressure. Now I should say, this thing built pressure shockingly quickly. With a full gas tank and full gas pressure, it built up to 60 PSI in a couple of minutes. My electric boiler, which I built previously, took about 25 minutes to get to 20 or 30 PSI. So compared to that, this thing is quite a rocket ship. Okay, approaching 60 PSI now, moment of truth. Safety valve is percolating. It's making some noise, like it's thinking about going off. And there it goes. So it went off early, it went off at 50 PSI, but that's okay. That would be close enough for what I'm doing here if this valve works out okay. The next test is, does the safety valve blow off efficiently enough to evacuate the boiler faster than the burner can make steam? That's really important, because if the safety valve can't stay ahead of the fire, then it's not going to keep the boiler safe. This one is not really doing that, so I shut the burner off and let the safety valve evacuate some of the boiler, because the next thing I need to know is, where does it shut off? You want it to close again 8 or 10 PSI from where it opened. And well, pressure's bleeding down, bleeding down, bleeding down, and it's not closing. With a little persuasion, it did finally close again, somewhere around 25 PSI. So not great performance, and it's not evacuating steam fast enough anyway, so this is not working great. While I'm here, I'll test the blowdown valve on the water gauge. There's an air bubble in it there, as you can see. So I crack that open and blow it down, close it again, and we've got a clean water level again. So that works excellently. It's a little victory. Then I lit the burner again and I figured, well, I'll give the safety valve one more try. So I let the pressure build back up again, and it's seeping quite a bit. I'm trying to get the ball to seat there. Once we're back up to about 50 PSI, then it does open again and starts blowing off, but once again, it's not really staying ahead of the burner. Maybe it barely, it's just kind of equalizing with the burner, and that's not really what I want. I want it to be able to stay ahead of the burner. Ultimately, I don't think this valve is going to work for me as is, so I opened the main valve there and I just bled the pressure out of the boiler slowly, let it cool off, and I'm going to take a look at this valve and see what's going on. Maybe we can make some improvements to it. Let's see what is inside this thing and how it works. And the answer is, well, it's extremely simple. It is literally just a stainless steel ball and a stainless steel spring. It's a ball and a spring. That's it. That's all that's in there. So the spring is presumably calibrated for about 60 PSI. Now, this is the very simplest form of safety valve. And I mean, it does 
work for what it is, but it's not sufficiently sophisticated for the performance that I want. So it was time to take myself to safety valve school. And for that, we have Kozo Hill Oka's book, Building the New Shea, which has an appendix in the back, which is an outstanding treatise on steam safety valves. Now I can't show you the content because it's copyrighted, but I can summarize it for you thusly. What you're looking for for good safety valve performance is that it should pop open sharply at the set pressure, evacuate steam efficiently down to about 8 or 10 psi, and then close again sharply and stay closed. Basically what we're looking for is a hysteresis effect. We call it the safety valve, but it's really the steam regulation valve. On a gas or a coal-fired boiler, this valve is what keeps the boiler pressure in the ballpark of the operating pressure. It works in conjunction with the fireman. There's a bunch of clever design features you can put in a safety valve to give it that performance, and I'm going to go over that as I attempt to modify this PM research valve to perform better. Step one is to increase the size of the orifice to evacuate steam more quickly than it's currently doing. So I want to make sure that the orifice is the limiting factor and not the casing here with the little holes in it, which it is not. I measured the size and did the math on the area there, and the orifice is in fact the limiting factor, as it should be, and it's too small. So Kozo-san's book has charts and tables for calculating how big the orifice on a safety valve should be for your boiler. So following his math, I enlarged it to the correct size. The same ball that came with the valve will work. Now I milled away some of the seat there, so I'm just using the old hammer trick to reseat the ball there and give it a little more of a purchase in there. And then a little magnification to ensure that I've got a good clean chamfer all the way around there for the ball to seal against. That looks like it's going to work. Now I've got the cover in the lathe and I'm drilling a hole in the center there where there currently isn't one. This is going to be a guide hole for a pin and ball carrier that I'm going to add in there. The reason that this valve doesn't close cleanly is that it doesn't have anything directing the ball back onto the seat properly. It's just floating in there on the spring. So I'm turning this piece of brass to be a close fit in the cover and I'm going to make a ball carrier out of this. This is again straight from Kozo-san's designs for these valves. Using a center drill deeper than you normally would go with one, you can create a quick and dirty ball holding cavity. So you intentionally make it too deep and then you mill the sides down to just past the equator of the ball bearing as it were. Again, this is all straight from Kozo-san's book. Now, I'm not being nearly as careful as he says you need to be for all of these steps, so it's entirely possible that when I'm done here, this isn't going to work at all. But I don't have anything to lose here, so I thought I'd give it a shot. And that looks about right, and the ball is thoroughly stuck in there, so I'll just leave it there because that's where I want it anyway. I begin parting this off, and I put a generous chamfer on the back of it, and Yahtzee. Now I need a little guide pin to go in the back of that carrier, so I've got a small piece of stainless here. You could, of course, make the entire ball carrier out of a single piece of stainless. That would be a good choice. I didn't have a piece that was appropriate, so I'm adding the pin as a separate component here. And I just need to turn this little pin down to a very thin diameter that'll fit through the center hole that we created in the cap. And this is part of what guides the ball carrier up and down and makes sure that the ball seats back on the valve seat when it closes. I'm taking very light cuts here because this is very thin material. It's not a very rigid setup for it. And this is stainless, so it cuts pretty tough. I'm using anchor lube for lubricant there. That's the toothpaste that you see me slapping on there. Works really well. A little bit of polish and just do a test fit here to make sure that we have a nice clean close sliding fit on the guide hole in the center of the cap there and that looks excellent. Now I've got the ball carrier flipped around in the fore jaw and I'm dialing that in and I'm going to put a little counter bore in the back of this to hold that guide pin. Once again it would have been easier to just make this from a single solid piece of stainless if you had their bright stock for it on hand but I didn't. So I'm drilling this a little undersized, and then I'm reaming it to the size of that pin that we had there. The stock that I used for that was precision ground stock, so it had a very nice diameter on it that I turned down, and then the wide base that was left is going to go into that hole right there. So that's the stock there, and that's a nice fit in there. That should work. And as you can see, the ball is still thoroughly stuck in there. 
Okay, I've got all the pieces apart now and cleaned everything up and I'm gonna put it all together with Loctite 603. So that's the stainless steel pin. You can see the shoulder that seats in the top of the ball carrier and then the ball is gonna get a little Loctite on it as well. I was able to push it out from the back once I had the hole through it for the pin. So I'm gonna Loctite that in place and clean up the excess. We don't want any Loctite on the valve seat. I let that cure overnight and now I'm filing two flat spots on the ball carrier. What this does is allows steam to get past the ball carrier and go out the top of the valve. I did the math on the secant of the circle there on each side to calculate how much of a flat spot I needed to equal the area of the orifice so that the steam can escape. This ball carrier actually does two other important jobs. It creates an interference just above the orifice so that when the spring starts to compress under the pressure, the steam accumulates under the ball carrier, it creates a little pocket and that creates the popping open effect. It creates a buildup of steam rather than just letting it seep out and causing the valve to open very slowly and clumsily. In fact, Kozo-san recommends a little annular groove on the bottom of the ball carrier to amplify that effect. And then it does the same thing in the other direction. As the valve is starting to close, the space above the ball carrier, below the enclosure of the valve, creates a little pocket where steam accumulates and builds up back pressure. And when the valve is starting to close, that back pressure is what creates the force needed to pop that valve back on the seat. Putting it all together now, you can see I've shortened the spring a little bit as well. I just cut coils out of it until it fit in the remaining space above the ball carrier there. And I'm altering the spring rate by doing that, but we'll see how this goes. I can adjust it if needed or make a new spring if needed. Just testing the ball lift here with a piece of copper wire and that looks good. Should have enough travel for steam to evacuate there. So, I mean, it's certainly a lot more complicated. Let's see if I've actually made it better. It's reinstalled and building pressure now and I'm flirting with 70 PSI there and it hasn't opened yet. It's not too surprising because I increased the spring rate quite a bit by shortening it the way I did. So I'll give it a little help here just to open. And it pops open very cleanly, so that's a good sign. It's blowing off very efficiently, so we definitely fixed that part of the problem. It dumps steam all the way down to 50, no problem with the burner on full. Now it's not closing, however, so I'm just giving it a little help here, see if I can get it to close. And it's not doing it, not doing it. Around 40 PSI, I decided to give it a little help, and I pushed down on the pin there, and away it went, closing very firmly. And the snap close action was very, very good as well. So I think what's actually happening here is the ball carrier is getting stuck. What I didn't show you is that the cap on this valve has threads all the way up. So it's not a smooth bore in there to slide the ball carrier on. I could try to turn the threads out of there or make a new cap or get crazy, but I've put enough time into this experiment and instead I went and bought two commercial safety valves to try out. On the left there is a Stuart Models safety valve and on the right is an AccuCraft. The left one is from the UK and the right one is an American company. So I'm going to give these a try. Both are 60 PSI from the factory. The AccuCraft one is also adjustable, which is nice. So I removed the standpipe because the whole point of that system is that I can change the threads on the top there to match the safety valve as needed. And then I put it right back on again because I decided actually it's easier to just make a little adapter for now because I don't know which one of these valves if either is going to work very well. And I don't want to make a new standpipe until I'm sure. So I made a janky little adapter for the Stewart valve. I'll give that a try first. All right, pressure is building. We're right around 60 PSI now. You can see the valve threatening to open. It's percolating and thinking about it. And there it goes. At least I thought there it went. Actually, this is just sort of partially open. Then a few seconds later, it really opened. So now it's blowing off properly. And the good news is it's really dumping steam efficiently. It's having no trouble staying ahead of the burner. That's a big win for the Stuart Models valve. Now let's see where it closes. Down to 50 PSI now and it's not closing yet. I'd really like it to be closing right about now. So giving it a little help there. See if maybe the ball needs help seating, but no dice, it's not closing. So I shut off the fire and let it blow down as far as it was gonna go. And it went down to 25 PSI and still blowing off. It's blowing off more quietly now, but it's still blowing off. And well, I just let it go and let it go and let it go and it emptied the entire boiler all the way down to zero and never closed again. So, uh, well, that's not too good. 
thumbs down so far on the Stuart model valve. Let's get this thing open and see what it looks like in there. I should say that the Stuart models valve was $50. The PM Research one was $15. So I'm expecting more sophistication from the Stuart models one. Inside here we have the cap which removes and yeah, it's a straightforward part there. There's the stainless steel spring as expected. And down in the business end there we've got a ball and a seat. Yeah, it's a ball and a spring identical to the PM Research valve. So not super impressed by that. Now there is a piece of something on the valve seat there, probably came up out of the boiler, construction debris, something like that. So I cleaned that valve seat up and tested it again. That might be why it wasn't closing all the way and let it rip once again. Blows off very nicely. And then it blew down all the way to 25 PSI and it did finally decide to close more or less around 25 PSI this time. So that's quite a bit too much hysteresis on this. It's really dumping a lot of steam. It's wasting a lot of fuel doing that and not very happy with it. Onto the AccuCraft valve now and another janky adapter. This valve has an O-ring on it, which is kind of neat. I don't need any Loctite there. And onto the standpipe. Once again, building pressure and around 65 PSI. It hadn't opened yet, so I took a pick and started playing with the adjuster. There's a center section that you can unthread to loosen the spring in there, lower the spring rate effectively. And I just twisted that until it started blowing off and that seems to be working quite well. This one is very quiet. You can hardly even hear it. And it blew off very efficiently all the way down to 50 PSI. So that's looking good. And then it closed again. Now it didn't close super tightly. It's still seeping a little bit, but in general, that worked pretty well. Opened at 65, closed at 50, and I'm pretty pleased with that. So I turned the fire back on and I wanna make sure it's gonna stay ahead of the burner. And sure enough, it is. As you can see, it's blowing off and it's dropped all the way back from 65 back down to 50 with the burner on full. It's having no trouble staying ahead of that burner. And then once again at 50, it closed again and the burner is still on full and it started building pressure again. So that's exactly what it should do. So I'm very pleased with this valve and this is going to be the one I'm going to go with. This boiler should now be ready to run an engine. But that's going to be next time. I'm just kidding. I'm not a monster. Of course we're going to run an engine this time. So I made this little adapter here to let me put a silicone hose on the steam valve there. Eventually this will all have hard plumbing on it. But for now, a little temporary bodge here. And the important thing with all this nice copper and bronze is to then cover it up with the jankiest, crappiest looking hardware store hose clamp that you can. It's very important in model engineering. Once again, kick the tires, light the fires, and while that's steaming up, I'm going to take care of the engine here. I've got to get all the lubrication sorted out. It's traditional to do this while you're building steam because you've usually got a few minutes to kill. So I'm going to top up the displacement lubricator there with steam oil, the thick goopy stuff that goes into the cylinder. And then I'll top up all of the lubricators on the moving parts of the engine itself with bearing and pinion oil. I did a whole video on steam engine lubrication if you want to know more about this whole process. All right, 40 pounds showing on the clock. Let's crack the valve, see if it'll run an engine. And there it goes. Engine runs a little rough while it pushes the water past the rings. There's no drain cocks on the cylinder on this engine. But that is running an engine on fire with my brand new built boiler. Well, how about that? That's running extremely well, I have to say. My last boiler was electric, and I will say that a gas-fired boiler is just that much cooler because, you know, you're creating energy from gas that was dug out of the ground. You're not just converting energy back and forth in different forms, which is kind of what the electric boiler is doing. It's kind of cheating. Now, of course, the ultimate is the coal-fired boiler because then you're literally making horsepower by digging rocks out of the ground, and that's how you start an industrial revolution. You might notice that there's more runout in the flywheel there than there has been in previous videos. And this is actually something that the casting has been doing. This casting has been slowly warping. I think some stresses were released when I machined it and it's been slowly getting worse. So I'm gonna probably remachine this flywheel at some point and take care of that. And I think one of my bearing caps might be a little worn. One end of the crankshaft is showing some runout as well. But you know, it's a steam engine. And the great thing about them is they can be all sad and broken and they still run. There's a reason that civilization started with these. Well, the boiler runs an engine, but 
it's far from done. We still need to put some lagging on there, and I think the burner still needs improvement. It's efficiency-wise struggling to keep up with the engine a little bit. It's not creating steam quite fast enough. So it needs more heat, and this boiler definitely needs a feed water pump. It makes steam like crazy, but boy, it goes through the water fast as well, and it doesn't have a lot of capacity like my pot boiler did that I built previously. So feed water pump coming soon. More videos to come on this project, but this is obviously a huge milestone, and I want to thank all of you who supported me all along the way, even through the times when I was cutting it apart on the bandsaw and starting over. Well, look where we got to now. Thanks for your support, especially to my patrons. You all are keeping this thing going, and I will see you next time.